talk radio exploring all sides of local national news politics and current events you're listening live on am 790 your source for business for sports new york yankees and everything that matters in life the coalition radio.us we can be found on facebook.com slash the coalition radio and of course on the mighty mighty twitter coalition underscore radio this week we are suspending our normal scintillating series of programming the opportunity to have something of an historic first, the first live on radio to you directly congressional debate for the seat Congressional District 1 in Rhode Island. Joining me tonight is my special guest, Russ Moore. Uh, Russ is a longtime friend of the coalition. Of course, you remember back in the early days of our internet only show, he was with us then. Man about town, raconteur, expert on the sport of kings. And now, probably one of the most prestigious jobs in new media in Rhode Island, Russ actually authors the Who's Hot and Who's Not column on GoLocalProv.com. Russ, welcome back to the Coalition. Thank you very much, P.O. It's great to be back. Um, yeah, Sport of Kings, I'm about $1,000 lighter than when I went to Saratoga a week ago, so thanks for bringing that up. Well, you're doing better than the state of Rhode Island, that's all we'll say. Maybe, that's, uh, maybe that should be Ms. Raimondo's new investment strategy for balancing pensions here in the state. So as I mentioned, we've got a special lineup today. Joining us later on in the show will be Congressman <coughs> David Cicilline to, uh, to take a couple questions live out in the air. We're catching him live at a couple of campaign events as he, as he traverses Rhode Island. Joining us today, first of all, I've got Stan Tran. Thanks for having me here. All right. I've got Matt Fecto. Thank you very much for having me. And I've got for the first time in studio Mr. Cormac Lynch. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks a lot for having me. Welcome to the coalition. We hope, you know, Stan and Matt have been here before. We hope to get you on here in the near future as well. Um, I want to get right down to it. First of all, as always, we set the ground rules for the coalition. Very simple. We are an outrage porn free zone. We do not waste our listeners' time with emotional events. We will not discuss gun raffles, Christmas trees, or anything silly on this. It's all about the issues. Number two, we do not hand handicap elections here. We have a commitment to the independent candidate. We have a commitment to the challenger. We don't care about your fundraising. We don't care about polling. We don't want to know if you're going to win. We want to know why you should. So in that spirit, the three of us are joined together in studio. I want to lead with Stan first. Stan, give us a couple of minutes and give us a little, little bit of background about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. So I'm a medical student at Brown right now. I'm in my last year of medical school, and I'm taking a year off to run for Congress. I had little interest in politics until I came to medical school, and I realized that my patients are getting sick because of the system. Uh, Congress has passed laws to protect the healthcare industry, and as a result of that, the cost of healthcare is way too high. And there are patients out there, I have a lot of patients, who can't afford the medications, cut their pills in half, don't take the medications at all. And so they're getting sick. And we saw recently with the VA health system in, in Providence, or sorry, in, in Phoenix, that if you can show that people are, are sick and dying from the system, then you might have some hopes for change. And that's why I'm doing this. I hope to show that people are suffering and that maybe we should get some change. But it's not just healthcare. I was a high school teacher before coming to medical school, and I think federal programs like Race to the Top have taken over our education system and squeezed out vocational training from high schools. In the state with the highest unemployment rate, uh, companies like Electric Boat can't find people with skills like welding, pipe fitting, plumbing to work on the Virginia class attack submarines, and that doesn't make sense. Rhode Island used to be the center of uh, manufacturing. Today, that's in Germany. Germany makes products like BMW, Audis, Mercedes, and that's because most of high school students in Germany goes through a vocational training program, goes through an apprenticeship. We need to bring that to Rhode Island to make Rhode Island uh, have a trained workforce and that will attract jobs back into the state. So that's what I'm trying to do on the campaign show, trying to talk about the issues. Thanks for having me here. Great. Again, joining us for the first time is Cormac Lynch. He's also running for the Republican nomination. Now, just a note, editorial note here. This is a bipartisan debate. For the first time, we're bringing together Democrats and Republicans because, again, it's all about issues. It's about problem solving. It's about addressing the needs of the individual Rhode Island taxpayer. So welcome back. To, I'm sorry. Welcome to the coalition. And why don't you just talk about yourself and give us your background? Of course. First of all, thanks again for having me on, Stan. Great to see you, Matt. Great to see you once again. Congressman Cicilline, thanks for tuning in and calling in later. My name's Cormac Lynch. I'm a native born and bred Rhode Islander. 
Um, I was born in Cranston. I grew up in South Kingstown. I'm currently a resident of Newport. At 19, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. It was the experience of a lifetime that made me the man I am today. That's the bread and butter of my candidacy, and that's why I'm running. By age 20, I was on orders to Fallujah, Iraq. And by age 21, as a young man defending the country, I was in what our nation's history has later judged the terrorist capital of the world. I think I learned more there than any school back here could have taught me. And I think I, I bring those hard <laughs> Hard truths and valuable lessons to this candidacy. Um, at its core, our government has not respected its men and women in uniform, and, and that's indicative across a couple fronts. Um, the 40 veterans who died waiting for health care this past April, um, we have the largest, most well-funded petroleum-based military the world's ever known. We spend more on national security than the next 20-something countries in the world combined. And it, it's taken us 13 years and counting to win a war in Afghanistan, and we're actively losing all the gains that, that we made in Iraq. It's not because of the men and women in uniform, right? They undertake our strategies with, uh, with honor, and they execute it to the, the best of anyone's expectations on the ground. It's not because of our economy. Our military is very well funded, so you have to ask why. And it's our civilian leadership at the highest levels of our government, and, and they got to go. And it's not just on the military front, although I do feel the primary responsibility of governments, the protection of its citizens. Uh, economically, we, we have not done well by our taxpayers. What will turn this state around and the country around is competition in both Forbes and CNBC has rated Rhode Island the least competitive state to do business in. I hold a bachelor's degree in finance from the University of Delaware. I worked at a bank in New York in addition to being a combat veteran. And I think those very valuable skill sets are going to be important to our next congressman. And once again, that's my background, and I thank you for, for having me on. Excellent. Thank you. Matt Fecto, running for the Democratic nomination against incumbent David Cicilline. Matt, give us a little bit more about your background. And, again, welcome back to the coalition. Matt uh, actually co-hosted once in what was uh, one of the more interesting moments as we did a dramatic interpretation of some of the email he's gotten from different constituencies. Matt, welcome back. Give us, give us, give the new listeners your background. Well, thank you very much again for having me. Um, I am a Rhode Island native. I've grown up in Rhode Island, and I was actually, I served in Iraq for roughly two and a half years. Now, that was probably the most difficult time in my life. Every single day, I thought about coming back to the state of Rhode Island. It's my home. And every single day, it was just one nightmare after another. And then when I finally get home, uh, the home I know, it, it's, it, it's in shambles. I, I'm running for Congress because I believe we deserve a whole lot better. I uh, see the scandals every single day, well, every other month, rather. Uh, and a lot of the scandals, they uh, go right back to the, old, the good old boy network that we have set up in uh, Rhode Island. The good old boy network has... Uh, They've helped each other out. Unfortunately, they've been leaving, leaving behind the people of Rhode Island. And th that's why I want to come back here. I want to fight for people, regular people, veterans, of course, the people who our government, the government of Rhode Island, is leaving behind. A little bit about my background. I have two master's degrees, an MBA from Texas A&M University, a master's in international relations, national security policy. I have a bachelor's in economics. I've worked for Congressman, Congressman Kennedy as an intern. I've also worked for President Obama as a national security intern. I have eight years military duty, military service, and I currently am a U.S. Army reservist who drills out of Newport, Rhode Island. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Well, we've established without a degree of doubt that the three guests are smarter than the hosts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no issues there. All right. I'm going to leave now. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, let me paint a picture. It's January 20th, 25th or so. You've been elected as the congressman for the first district for the state of Rhode Island. You're caucusing with your respective parties. The opportunity comes up. As an emerging new congressman, they're going to give you a shot to really follow your passion. Uh, starting out, actually, with Cormac, 
what's and then following in, in succession, what's the committee post you desire most, and what would your legislative priority? Recognizing that as a freshman congressman, you've got some challenges there in terms of the seniority system. But what you, what would be your passion, and what would you want to pursue right as you hit the ground? Right as I hit the ground, I would get on the House Armed Services Committee, and uh, I know rank matters a lot in Washington, but I think we need to start valuing experience over rank. So I'm going to say who else was a machine gunner in Fallujah, who else has worn our nation's uniform, who else understands the trials and tribulations that they go through. And when no one else raises their hand, or very few do, um, hopefully I'll be a shoe into that position. Excellent. You know, legislatively, you know, there's some real challenges that we're going to touch on later in the show, but what would be your... I mean, is it NDAA? Is it the defense budget? What What's the passion that you would pursue from that uh, from that seat? I think we need to prioritize the defense budget. I I, I think there's certainly room to bring uh, efficiencies to it. I think first things first. Although some may see this as outside the the, the scope of of that position, we need to secure our border, right? A, a nation that not, cannot control its borders is not a nation. We can go over our policy of every other country in the world and our military strategy there, but I think we need to fix the problems at home first. And, and, and I think, especially from a military national security strategy, we got to secure the border. Okay, fair enough. Mr. Fecto, your yes, comments, sir. your thoughts. Um, I would probably like to be on the Armed Services Committee. I mean, I'm a military veteran. I served two and a half years in Iraq. Uh, I know the military, uh, in the military industrial complex, how it impacts the, the the state of our country right now. If you look at what's taking place even in Ferguson, Missouri, I mean, it's, it's largely because of what well, I blame on the uh, military industrial complex. The the military, the uh, contractors do have an oversized influence in our domestic policy and foreign policy. Uh, I would probably like to change that. But uh, unfortunately, uh, not 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 in a way that would adversely impact job creation or job growth in the state of Rhode Island. We have the highest unemployment rate, so I would probably be uh, prone to look at military programs making the the defense more efficient, defense Department of Defense more efficient, but not in an adverse way that would impact job growth in Rhode Island. So that's excellent. Stan Tran. My priority in Congress would be to reduce federal spending and reduce taxes. And so I would look at, which I have done, look at the, the, the portion of the pie that the federal government spends on different things. Mm-hmm. The biggest part of that pie is health care spending. Health care now takes up 18% of GDP. So that means like if you make $50,000 a year, that's like $10,000 that's going to health care. And you're not seeing that money because it's being spent by employer, by the government, whatever. And so people aren't being outraged at how much money is being wasted on health care. There are so many ways to make it cheaper and more affordable. In this country, we spend the most on healthcare of any country and have one of the worst health outcomes. And as a medical student, I can see, and I can give you four or five ideas, new ideas that people aren't talking about on how to reduce the cost of healthcare spending. So for example, allowing patients to buy drugs from other countries. There's no competition in this country because the industry has written to law a legal monopoly, and that's not right, it's not fair. There's no competition, and it hurts patients. Um, There's... People are afraid of lawsuits. Doctors are afraid of lawsuits. And it's not so much that they're getting sued, but that fear drives them, drives up extra testing in the system. And that's bad for patients. It slows down care. Doctors are afraid to say things openly to patients because of the, it might be used against them later in the court of law. So we can reform those systems, the tort system, reform the prescription drug system. There are a lot of things that we can do to reduce the cost of health care. If we can do that, that's going to reduce our debt, reduce our taxes. Very interesting points, and that was actually a great segue to my next question, which I wanted to ask you guys. How do you feel about um, Obamacare? Would you leave it intact? Would you try to create a caucus to change it? Would you uh, try to enhance it? So I just wanted to ask all three of you. I'd like to start with Stan, because seeing that you brought us to this topic, how do you feel about Obamacare? What would you do? Go. Sure. So before Obamacare, the problem in healthcare was that things cost too much, and today we still have the same problem. Obamacare hasn't fixed that. What Obamacare did was to give health care to people who couldn't afford it. Now, to fix Obamacare, we have to come up with ideas to make things... To, to fix the health care system, we have to come up with ideas to make things cheaper. Repealing Obamacare doesn't fix things. I mean, it, it, it changes a few things, but it doesn't fix the fundamental problem of the price of health care. So the ideas I've mentioned, I like to put, put those into play, improve the coordination of care, 
So you'd like to leave Obamacare as it is and then implement your ideas like tort reform and uh, allowing patients to buy drugs from Canada, so on and so forth. So the re- reality of the situation is I think Obamacare is here to stay. I think it's, it's, we've, the Republicans have voted over 50 times to try to repeal it. It hasn't happened. It's time to move on and try okay. to... Okay, yeah. great. Cormick, is Obamacare here to stay? Tell I- me. I think if I had my choice, it wouldn't be, but you have to respect that the Supreme Court upheld it. Um, so I think, yes, it is here to stay. The Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional. They didn't say that it was a good thing and that we shouldn't change it legislatively. R- the right. question is, would you change? Would you work, would you build a coalition in Congress I would re- to scrap it? No, I, I would reform it, not repeal it. I, I, I think our health system prior to Obamacare was in, in many ways indefensible. I, I, I certainly think in a country as rich as ours that... We should have access to health care, but there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it, right? A federal hijacking of the entire health care system isn't, it's not productive, it's not beneficial, and it's not solving, most importantly, a lot of the problems that Obamacare set out to solve. Thank you. How about you, Mr. Fecktow? What are your ideas on Obamacare and health care in this country in general? Well, I I was somewhat actually disappointed in Obamacare. I I was. Now, uh, uh, Stan did point out the intent of Obamacare was to expand medical coverage to the 15 percent of Americans who do not have health care coverage. And I would probably like to have uh, I would have been a strong proponent for a strong public option that would have reined in the administrative would, would have competed with the other private sector entities and reined in their administrative expenses. So I, I think that we need to reform Obamacare. I think we need to improve it. And the polls do support that the, uh, the the public in general, they would like to see improvements in Obamacare. So, uh, I, again, I would support a strong public option. Excellent. I think one, one follow-up, if you don't mind, no, no matter what your position is on Obamacare, I think what frustrates people most is the political stalemate and the politics as usual and, and the dishonesties from the federal government. Uh, I think, you know, qu- quotes such as, you can keep your doctor if you like him or her from the president, right? And and then when, when those things turn out not to be true, I, I think that's what frustrates people, regardless of their position on it. And, and I think we need representation in Washington that's going to hold that executive branch accountable, you know? Uh, it, it, there was a, a quote about intelligence from a host here at the start of the hour. It, it's really not so much about intelligence. Clearly, we need to send sharp people to Washington, but it's about moral courage, Right. This, this executive branch has this executive branch has overstepped its boundaries on a variety of occasions, and we need a legislative apparatus to keep it in check and stand up for the people. Well, well, it goes back to the fact that we need to improve Obamacare. And Obamacare, as you did point out, the the healthcare the the way healthcare was set up before Obamacare was implemented was indefensible. So, as far as Obamacare should it be improved, absolutely. But at least President Obama did have the courage to take on the pharmaceutical industry, take on this this horrendous problem that was taking place in our country, and did get something accomplished. I think the pharmaceutical I, lobbyist is still very prevalent and a big problem in today's well, government. But, but, but let, me, let me get Stan in here for a second. I mean, yeah. as someone who's worked on the front lines of this, I mean, ultimately what I worry about over the next six to eight months or a year is the systemization breakdown that's going to take place because of the vast amount of data that's being asked to be coordinated from so many different sources. That touches on your question about the practical nature and the implementation and <clears throat> the, uh, let's just say, the, the uh, manipulation of claims. Stan, is it possible for all of this stuff to come together in, in the soup and work? It hasn't, and I guess there's still time for th- things to get better, possibly, but I'm not hopeful about it. What Matt said about uh, Obamacare standing up to the special interests, that, that's not true. I, I disagree with that. I think the Obamacare was a sellout to all the special interests. I mean, it, written into the law was that the pharmaceutical industry can't negotiate prices for the drugs. Sorry, the, the government can't negotiate prices for the drugs that they buy so that they have to pay whatever prices the industry charges. Um, there are examples of things like it, it's legal for pharmaceutical industries to pay their competitors to not put products on the market. That just violates like free free market mechanisms. Well, oh, I mean that's what part of the uh, piece of Obamacare legislation needs to be improved there. Sure. But if you think about it, before I mean that's before we implemented Obamacare, 
our healthcare system was a complete mess. And just because we can't have a revolutionary solution, I prefer prefer an incremental solution over a revolutionary solution. And given the fact the pharmaceutical industry does make a lot of substantial campaign contributions to a number of the Republican caucus, I have to say that it was – it, it, it's pretty reasonable as far as how it came out. Should we improve it? Absolutely. But to say that we should not have, we should not do anything. I would say that oh, I'm not saying you're saying that, but yep. but it, it's a it's a reasonable improvement. I, I think what what we needed is reform with pharmaceutical lobbyists, and we needed health insurance reform, n- not a federal hijacking of of the health care system. But speaking more broadly, to get anything done in Congress today with the gridlock that goes on, you can't have ideas that are just Republican in nature or ideas that are Democratic in nature because it's so polarized that it's just not going to pass. You need original ideas, that practical solutions that can work, and I think that's what we're looking for. In the- well, well I, I agree with that, but we have to get money out of politics, and, and that, that's a key, key reason why there's polarization going on. I mean, corporations dump millions of dollars into the political system. Right. Through, I, I agree with Matt yeah, on, that, yeah. on that point very much. And, uh, you know, it, it, it galvanizes the system. It polarizes it. Sure. So talk about campaign finance reform. I'd like to get the opinion of all three of you. I mean, Matt, you seem to obviously be in favor of campaign oh, absolutely. finance reform. What, what do you see that looking like? Oh, God. I, I, I would like – I would support an amendment that overturns Citizens United. Unfortunately, Congressman Cicilline, he says the same thing. But the t- big difference is between me and Congress, Congressman Cicilline, I'm not receiving money from – special interest groups. So uh, I sincerely believe we need an amendment, a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, which was a, a, a very, very bad Supreme Court ruling. We've got about two minutes before the break. Stan, Cormac, each give us a minute or so if you can on campaign finance reform. I think corporations should not be allowed to donate at all to political campaigns. The, the Citizens United rule that money is a form of free speech, and I don't think it's true because the more money you have, the more speech you have, and that's not right. I think every individual should have equal speech, and so money shouldn't matter. Um, the, the government is here to serve the people, not to serve corporations. And so if we took corporations and uh, not allow them to give to mon- money to politicians, and they would respond better to the needs of people, which is what the government should do. Right. Corporations care about bottom line and shareholder value. Uh, the, the Supreme Court also decided that when, in, in various rulings. They don't care about um, what's beneficial for the, the individual. Um, so I, I certainly disagree with, with Citizens United. Um, furthermore, I, I th- I'm for campaign finance reform, but I, I think the reason why we have that is to make sure we do not permit entrenched politicians that are not executing the will of the people. So I, I would be, f- one, for campaign finance reform, and two, for term limits. Excellent. Excellent. But briefly, in a couple of words, don't you worry about the free speech implications of that? Uh, no. I, I, well, no, I, well no, no one's saying individuals can't donate. Yeah, right? I, mean, I mean, free speech implications. A corporation's not a living, breathing person. I, I don't understand what the what do you mean by free speech implications. You see, I believe firmly that corporations are, in effect, in a, let's just say an accumulation of individual interests that advance our capitalistic system. Well, I, I would, don't I would they I, have a vested interest. I at would, the dis- table? I would disagree with that. I would, I, they're not going to advance our capitalistic system. They, they're there to advance their stockholders' interests. They, they are. Their employees' interests, their stockholders' interests. I own, own several stocks, and mm-hmm. you know something. Uh, corporations, they're in it, in it for the bottom line. They're in it for profitability. And well, thank well, you very much. Well, no, we're going to have to take a little break now. Great stuff. We are the coalition. We are exploring all sides of local, national news, politics, and current events. You're listening to AM790, your source for business talk radio. We'll be right back. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. Call 877-319-MYTV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. So cancel the cable and get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 877-319-MYTV. At just $24.99, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 877-319-MYTV. That's 877-319-MYTV. 
Today is the day you switch to Rite Aid for one simple reason, Wellness Plus, the card that gives you credits you can use like cash, plus discounts that only members get, plus 20% off almost the entire store, plus that's for a whole year, plus rewards that start today and pile on every time you shop. So if you're tired of missing out on all the pluses only Rite Aid delivers, visit RiteAidWellness.com to sign up and learn more today about Wellness Plus. Rite Aid, with us, it's personal. TrueCar.com is changing car buying forever. Yep, every day, TrueCar users receive negotiation-free guaranteed savings. Some features not available in all states. TrueCar users save an average of $3,078 off MSRP. When you're ready to buy a car, go to TrueCar.com and find out what others paid for the car you're looking for. Then register at TrueCar to see upfront pricing information and lock in your savings. Finally, just print out your TrueCar savings certificate and take it to the TrueCar certified dealer. Visit TrueCar.com today. That's TrueCar.com. Hey. AM 790 Talk and Business is your home for I Miss in the Morning, New York Yankees baseball, and great local and national talk. You can check out the podcasts of your favorite AM 790 shows at 790business.com. I Miss in the Morning, New York Yankees baseball, and great local and national talk all on AM 790 Talk and Business. The Dennis Miller Show on AM 790 Talk and Business. And I'm 54 years old and I'm going, where do we go? And what, what is the solution? Not to get all deep, but I love listening to Texas. You. Going, I ponder this often. Texas. Morning. What's the next step, my man? Texas. Head to Texas. Everybody will reconnoiter there. They'll be the last people to accept this crap. Smart, entertaining, and relevant. The Dennis Miller Show. Weekdays at noon on AM 790 Talk and Business. Your home for Yankees baseball. Manchester 65 is New England's newest live music and events venue. If you're not completely enjoying your current live music experience, there is another option. Manchester 65 is large enough to support touring acts, yet small enough for that local feel. For upcoming events, go to Manchester65.com. Make it your place. Manchester65.com. ProvidenceNightOut.com is a one-stop destination website where you'll discover a comprehensive guide of everything that the Providence area has to offer. Nightlife, entertainment, dining and dancing, community and family events, and so much more. Download the free app called My Night Out. It's ProvidenceNightOut.com. Mike's Professional Tree Service offers top-of-the-line tree removal, trimming, stump grinding, stump removal, and so much more. Mike's Professional Tree Service will do everything to safeguard your home and property and is fully licensed and insured. Call them today at 401 423-7485 823-7485 for a free estimate on tree service, tree removal, trimming, and tree care. That's 401-823-7585. Mike's Professional Tree Service are the tree experts serving all of Rhode Island. Online at mikesprotree.com. That's mikesprotree.com. Midday Records is a label that is comprised of local artists and exists for the sole purpose of helping other local artists find new opportunities and to help build a more thriving New England music scene. Midday Records hosts the area's fastest growing music related networking event, the Midday Social. Books Midday Records presents shows throughout New England, releases compilations featuring local music, promotes bands through the Midday Blog, are the co founders of Music for Pause, and has recently started an artist development and management division. Stay up to date with Midday Records by checking them out on your favorite social media site like Facebook and Twitter and find them online at MiddayRecords.com. That's MiddayRecords.com. We are the Coalition, exploring all sides of local, national, news, political, current, social events here on AM Talk Radio 790. Today we have the unique privilege of hosting the first live debate for the, both the nomination and election of Congressional District 1 for the state of Rhode Island. Joining me, Russ Moore, as always, raconteur, man about town, 
and author of perhaps one of the most important columns here in Rhode Island now on golocalprov.com, the who's hot, who's not, the real barometer of everything important in Rhode Island politics. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And yes, I agree. It's actually the most uh, important column in the history of Rhode Island. <laughs> there you go. Delusions of grandeur across the board here in the state. <laughs> but, um, you know, we've also got, and let me just run through the candidates. Uh, Stan Tran. Stan, thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me here. Matt Fechtel. Thank you very much again. And, of course, Cormac Lynch. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, we do have a special guest on the line, uh, Congressman David Cicilline. Congressman Cicilline, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And I, I couldn't agree more. The most important column in the history of Rhode Island. <laughs> Absolutely. Congressman, first of all, we appreciate you taking a few minutes to to join us today. I know you've got a hectic schedule. So go right to the issues, because this is Issues Radio. Um, this is fundamental a libertarian show. And uh, we were both surprised and, and I've got to admit, delighted, uh, about a year and a half ago, when the uh, or two years ago almost at this point, when the NDAA uh, was up for its annual debate. And you had the Amash Smith uh, amendment to it, which was going to eliminate, um, shall we say, uh, detaining without habeas corpus, if I have that correctly. Mm -hmm. you know, now, you cross the aisles. Uh, you, you actually cross the aisles both within the delegation here in Rhode Island as well as nationally. What, what were your thoughts behind that, and what's the future of that style of legislation? Well, it's a kind of interesting. First of all, uh, I'm delighted to be on and say hello to my three opponents, uh, and thanks for letting me participate. Um, you know, I think what's been very interesting on this civil rights issue and this privacy issue is there's been a kind of an interesting coalition of people from the you know pretty far right in the Republican caucus, and obviously some uh, people who are from the progressive side of the Democratic caucus. But I think at the core of it is grave concern about the collection uh, of data and about the a detention of people without due process. And so there have been a number of amendments that I think are important reforms that would, you know, close Guantanamo Bay, ensure that we don't have uh, detentions of individuals without due process, uh, reforms of the uh, Patriot Act, the U.S. Freedom Act, to be sure that there are uh, reforms are in place, uh, additional transparency in the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. So I think there, there has been a lot of concern about the the government's collection of information about the detention of people, about Guantanamo Bay. And I think, you know, Guantanamo Bay and it being open has become a kind of rallying cry in many ways for some of the enemies of the United States. And I think it's contrary to our values as a country that you would detain people without due process and without charges for extended periods of time. And I, I think, you know, we have to do everything we can to assist the president's uh, intention to close Guantanamo Bay and to be sure that we don't have people that are detained uh, who are not charged for extended periods of time. I think that's contrary to our founding principles and something that we shouldn't allow to happen. Do you uh, do you have any legislation? I mean, what, what's your thoughts on this going forward? Because, again, as a libertarian show, we're, we're very concerned on this and issues like the war on drugs and, you know, the militarization of our police in this country. Um, any thoughts? Well, there's an amendment that was offered during the uh, National Defense Authorization Act uh, offered by uh, Congressman Smith that would have eliminated the indefinite detention for individuals uh, under the authority of the uh, use of military force. There was uh, also an amendment offered by Representative Smith uh, that would have provided a framework for the closing of the facility at Guantan uh, on uh, at Guantanamo Bay. Those were also uh, developed into bills uh, in both last Congress and this Congress. Um, and, you know, we don't yet have enough people to actually pass them, but I think there's, you know, bipartisan support, but we have got to I keep the pressure on this. There was also an effort made to defund some of the collection program, and eventually we did pass some meaningful reforms. But um, we have also communicated with the president in a, a series of letters. Again, these are bipartisan uh, to raise very serious concerns about the collection data by the NSA, the use of that data. And, you know, we're living in a, in a world where there's an incredible ability to collect and keep and review information uh, from citizens of this country, and we have to be sure that it's being done, obviously consistent with our Constitution and consistent with privacy interests of individuals and recognizing that there's also a response to keep people safe so that we can do that uh, in a way that honors our values as a country. 
Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Russ Moore from Go Local Prof here. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, it's I'd like to ask you a question about the United States Post Office. It seems like it's no secret that the organization is hemorrhaging money on a quarterly basis. The Republicans seem like their solution would to be to basically privatize it or um, take steps that look like privatization. What is the Democrat plan or what is your plan to save the post office? What would you do or what would you recommend uh, be done to, to try to stem the, uh, you know, the the loss of money that they're uh, incurring? Well, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the, the, at the operation of the Postal Service, I mean, a big portion, in fact, really the driving force for the, the challenge that the post office faces uh, is that they are being required under law to make payments, pension payments, far in excess of what anyone, I think any responsible analyst says is appropriate. And then if you eliminated that requirement, which is basically a super um, burden on on the post office to make, you know, pension payments well in advance, uh, far beyond what anyone contemplates is reasonable, they would have, in fact, no financial problems. So I think there is a bill uh, that will fix that, that will eliminate this um, unfair requirement. And I think the post office has done a lot to improve their efficiency. They've had to respond to a significant drop in regular mail, but a significant increase in package delivery because of online purchases. So. I think they're they're responding to that, and people rely on the mail service. But I think what we should be looking at in a serious way is this reform that would eliminate this excessive pension payment that I don't think there's a, at least I haven't had a good policy or argument uh, around, that's putting them in a really precarious position. So right. I think that's what we ought to do. We ought to move forward on that reform, relieve them of what I think is an unreasonable requirement, and then continue to encourage them to be exploring efficiencies and be sure that they are, um, you know, doing all that they can to operate uh, efficiently, but also recognizing that particularly small businesses rely on their delivery. Do you have, uh, Congressman, I'm going to turn the spotlight a little bit. Do you have any questions for us or any of your of your fellow candidates? Uh, I'm, I'm not in a habit of asking moderated questions, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, I think I had had the opportunity to listen in the past to uh, my opponents, and you know, I think one thing that I would say that, you know, this is a very dysfunctional Congress. There's no question about it. And I think uh, while I've made efforts uh, to work with colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and I think I've done that with some success, I think fundamentally this election is about whether or not uh, we need a change in Washington and change uh, the leadership of the Congress. Because, you know, the, the Speaker of the House really sets the agenda. The majority party sets the agenda. And no matter how many great ideas the Democrats generate, it's up to the Speaker to decide whether they come to the floor. And I think Speaker Boehner has uh, not earned the right to remain as our Speaker for two more years. I think, you know, the frustration felt by Rhode Island and by the American people is a frustration of not getting things done, not reaching compromises on important bills. And I think it's important that uh, this message, you know, we need 17 more seats to take back the House. And I think, you know, that will allow us to really promote an agenda that helps the middle class, that makes college affordable, you know, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, make sure women are uh, paid equal pay for equal work, raise the minimum wage, uh, ensuring that we're ending tax breaks for companies that ship American jobs overseas. You know, a real agenda to grow the middle class in this country. You know, Washington is filled with lobbyists who advocate for tax policies for the richest people in this country and the most right. powerful corporations. And it's time we start enacting policies that help Hard-working middle class. No, un- understood. In, in, in our closing time here, uh, you know we've we've reached sort of a crisis stage, foreign policy-wise. Uh, d- did this country's defense mechanisms, State Departments, did they take ISIS seriously enough? Is was is, are we at a crisis point that's beyond repair with the ISIS well, situation? I don't think we're beyond. I don't think we're at a crisis point beyond repair because ISIS is a brutal terrorist organization that we have a responsibility to protect the American people and uh, our allies and the national security interests of the United States. I don't know that anybody anticipated the brutality of this terrorist organization, but I think they were certainly on the radar, both the defense and state departments, our intelligence agencies. Um, But, you know, this is a complicated terrorist organization. You know, it's not a country. It's not, you know, it's not like we're dealing with a head of state. This is a a network of terrorists who are, you know, span on several countries and have been involved in Syria and are involved in Iraq uh, and other parts of the region. And, 
Uh, I think the challenge we face is, you know, there's tremendous resistance, as there should be, for re-engaging in another sectarian war. Uh, at the same time, I think people recognize that this is different than an effort where we're trying to help change leadership in a country or, you know, regime change. This is about protecting the United States and American citizens and our interests from terrorist organizations, and we have to do this. Uh, I think the president is, you know, contemplating and weighing how do we do that in a way that protects American national security interests, but but puts pressure on others in the region to do their part to combat this terrorist group and, and carefully doesn't, you know, guard against mission creep so that we're not back engaged in another war. Mm-hmm. You know, we lost, you know, more than 4,400 people in Iraq, great American heroes, more than 32,000 Americans were maimed in that war. We spent $1.7 trillion in almost a decade of time devoted to it, and I think the time has come for the Iraqi people to stand up and take responsibility for their own country. At the, at the same time, this, ISIS is a real threat, and I think the president is right to be um, fashioning a response to, to this very serious terrorist organization. Well, thank you very much. La- last question, if you will. Will you be, as the campaign proceeds, will you be engaging any of the gentlemen in this room in any further um Tete any, uh, oh, any discussion? Oh, absolutely. We had, uh, we had a debate or forum at Laurel Lee, and I know we had one at the Portuguese American Committee. Uh, I know that Stan came to, I guess the others weren't available, and we, uh, I'm sure that we're going to have other opportunities. And I hope, uh, if, if I'm fortunate enough to be the Democratic nominee, that we'll have some debates with whoever the Republican nominee is, is as well. Well, thank you for coming on our show. Thank you for my supporting, pleasure. supporting thank Independent you. Thank Radio. You my and I apologize. I'm not there in person. Well, have a great night, Congressman right. David Sicily. Thank you. Uh, is there any way I can respond to some of that? Uh... Of, of course, and that's 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 what radio is live radio is all about. Uh, um, but let's you know again. Let's let's focus on issues. Okay. But, uh, number one, we didn't have a debate. We can just clarify that we, mm-hmm. there was there was no debate that took place. I look forward to having a debate with Congressman Cicilline mm-hmm. at a later date. And very soon, though, because yeah, election before is, September 9th, Matt. Before, yeah, right. absolutely, yeah, very soon, very soon. Yeah. So and, to back Matt up on that point, the organizer of the Laurel Mead Forum made it very clear that this was to be a forum where we're not to engage other candidates in in direct questioning, despite what the Providence Journal says. But uh, anyway, and w- with regards to his uh, privacy concerns, Congressman Cicilline, he has some uh, nerve it listing the privacy concerns, given the fact he voted for the FISA amendments in 2012. He voted to expand, well, e- extend the NSA's surveillance power. It's 2012. And he also voted for a the USA Freedom Act, which did nothing to rein in the NSA's power. So Congressman Cicilline, he's more than welcome to... Uh, to talk about his his privacy credentials, but unfortunately, reality does not uh, does not fit. What are you, uh, Cormac, as as a veteran as well? Your thoughts on NSA? Your thoughts on privacy? Your thoughts on spying? I I think in relation to the the congressman's com comments, I think you need to take a look at the the timing of things. Right, everything he said was a future reference. Mm-hmm. Everything he said was what we're, we should now do going forward. But well, we're, we're going to close Guantanamo Bay. We've only c- talked about it for the past ten years, and this Congress hasn't been able to get anything done. But no, this time around, it's actually going to happen. People don't buy it anymore, right? It's falsified. The notion that oh, we got a plan to close Guantanamo Bay—they're right next to Lois Lerner's emails, <laughs> right? Come on, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not—it's not going to happen, right? People don't have the faith and the confidence and the trust in the government well, because they've been fundamentally dishonest with them on a number of issues, right? <laughs> and and it's to the detriment of our national security, right? And and I just I, I disagree with him completely about ISIS when he says, you know, it, no one really knew that this was going to happen or planned this. I think every one of our intelligence agencies would disagree. I, 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 would, I, would, I would disagree. I would say that took the, the ISIS threat did take us by surprise. Matt, uh, in, in, or, in well, organization well, let me ask you the like, question. Should it have taken us by they, surprise? They well, don't get $2 billion in assets overnight. I'm sorry. They don't span two countries, uh, put Christians through the crosshairs, right? It, it control oil fields in the Middle East well, and, and get to the point where they are now overnight. It, it didn't take us by surprise because our vision of what Iraqi should be and their vision hasn't matched. 
And because of that, there's no way that there's a there's a future there. Well, as far as ISIS gaining ground, I think that took us very much by surprise, and a lot of intelligence agencies by surprise. The, the but, speed of how much it gained ground caused it by surprise. As far as Congressman Cicilline just saying that they're a terrorist organization, I, I wish to God they were a terrorist organization, and that's where I disagree with Congressman Cicilline. They're not a terrorist organization. They control territory the size of Belgium. Right, and okay. they they have, and they have four billion dollars, and they have infiltrated the government. But like, realistically, this is what's kind of frustrating, right? What did you think we were just going to leave the country and wave a magic wand? Why is everyone so surprised about this? How could am, am well, I the well, only, am I the only one? Call me, call me. I think come on, as far is, as far as George Bush did tell us, we were going to be showered with rose petals well, when we first listen, intervened okay, in okay, two thousand three. Right, 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 one at a time, one at a time. All right, here. so, so well, let me phrase a question. Let me jump in here and phrase a question. And and it's tough because Stan, it, it, it's you. You've served this nation in other ways. You've been a teacher. You're a doctor. You're on the front lines of the medical system. But I have to ask this question first to Matt and then to Cormac. You were both the quote-unquote boots on the ground. And I hate that euphemism because it, it, it neutralizes the impact of what's effect on people's lives dramatically. But in, in, a, in the minute or two that we got left, a minute for each of you, what does it mean to you on a personal level, the collapse of Iraq, after both of you, investing literally your lives in that uh, it, it's I mean my god <laughs> you, you know every day you just see it and it's in turmoil and you think about I spent about two and a half years of my life overseas in Iraq and every day I was told that the cause was worth it and yet you'd see people our, our fellow service members die it, it, it's terrible it, it's a terrible feeling it's uh, something that I don't wish on anyone the two and a half years I mean it's it's I forfeited I forfeit two and a half years of my life for the cause, the Iraqi, the Iraq cause, the Iraq war, and now it's uh, unfortunately back in turmoil. So I'm frustrated, I'm angry, upset, and uh, not happy. Needless to say, Cormac, I, I agree with Matt to a certain extent. I think the, and I'm not saying my party was perfect with this, but but by <laughs> no, any means, I, no, I mean I no. think I think the Bush administration was as irresponsible with their entrance to Iraq as the Obama administration was to their from their entrance. Um, it, it's time to start putting people and national security issues over politics, right? Uh, th there was uh, – America left a lot there, right? And, and I think our, our government has an obligation to the service members that sacrificed there, uh, to our allies in the region, and, and to the Iraqi government to do what we can diplomatically to, to see those efforts through. I, I think primarily it is – Iraq needs to take responsibility. On, it, on that note, let me jump in because I want to get Stan in here. Stan, in the minute and a half we've got left of the show, because we're gonna we, we close with commercials, and thank you to all our sponsors. All right, in the minute and a half we've got left, what is the issue of the election? Are we moving past the the, the economy? Stupid. Are we over Obamacare? Is it all of a sudden going to be national security? What what what's your temperature on 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 this country right now? I think the people want Congress to do something productive for them, and the reality of the situation is that nothing has happened because of, of partisan bickering. People aren't coming up with original, creative, positive ideas to move the country forward, both in education and economy and health care. In, in every aspect you look at it, Congress hasn't done anything, and people are frustrated and they want change. Excellent. Gentlemen, uh, first of all, let's go around the room quickly. How can we contact each one of your campaigns? Cormac. www.cormaclynchforcongress.com, P.O. Box 709, Newport, Rhode Island, 02840. Thanks a lot for having me on. Stan. My website is www.stantran.us. My in in email, phone number, everything's on that website. Excellent. Matt. My website is www.matt4ri.com, and it's no longer being redirected to a porn site, so um, it's rated G. <laughs> So feel free to just log on. I'm also on Facebook, too. Excellent. I want to thank Russ Moore for joining us. Uh, again, man about town, expert on the sport of kings. What, what, what's your take on tonight, Russ? What's going on tonight? <laughs> oh, my God. A debate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I had a great time. <laughs> we are the Coalition on Talk Radio. Thank you very much. Exploring all sides of local, national news, politics, current events on AM790, your source for news and business.